This lesson is about the ellipse. So let me give you the definition of an ellipse. An ellipse is defined as the set of all points P in a plane such that the sum of the distances from P to two fixed points is a given constant. And those two fixed points are each called a focus and together they are called foci. So what this definition means is that if I find the distance between a point and a focus and the point and the other focus and I add these two distances together, they're going to be the same for every single point along the ellipse. And so now let me show you how to generate an ellipse using this definition. So here are my two foci, focus one and focus two. And this is a point P on the ellipse. And up here in the corner, you can see the distance between the point uh, on the ellipse and C and the point on the ellipse and F. And here is the sum of those two distances. And notice what's going to happen with this number as I animate this point G to create my ellipse. So as G moves around, you'll see that these points here are the points on the ellipse. And these two distances are different, but their sum in this case is always 10.7. And of course, I can change the orientation of my foci and I can change the radius. And no matter what I do to it, I'm still going to get an ellipse. So that was how we created an ellipse. Now let's look at some vocabulary associated with the ellipse. Of course, first we have focus or foci are the two fixed points of the ellipse. And then we have these things called focal radii. And the focal radii are the distances between the two foci and the point on the parabola. So PF1 is a focal radii and PF2 is a focal radii. And we have, of course, two for the ellipse. Now, ellipses, in addition to having the two foci, also have a center. And the center is defined as the midpoint of the line segment containing the two foci. So it's right there in the middle. And we're going to need that when we have to write equations later. Next, we have something called a major axis. And the major axis is a chord passing through the foci. And it's the major axis because it's going to be the longest axis of the ellipse. Then, in contrast to the major axis, we have the minor axis, which is the chord containing the center, which I have not drawn in the picture, sorry, and is perpendicular to the major axis. And it is, of course, the smallest chord that you can draw in the ellipse. So let's do this by definition. So I'm giving you the foci and the sum of the focal radii. Now, we're not going to do this every single time I ask you to write an equation for an ellipse. That would be torturous and mean. Um, the equation we're going to come up with at the end is actually really nice and totally related to the major and minor axes. So when I ask you to write an equation for an ellipse, please do not default to using the definition because by definition, the sum of the two focal radii has to be a constant. And remember, the focal radii is distance from a point on the ellipse to a focus and we have two of these and I'm going to have to use the distance formula twice for this and it's going to leave me with an incredibly horrible equation as you're about to see. So by definition this is the equation I have to get and that's technically the equation for an ellipse that has this these criteria but that's not the way I want the equation to look. I need to simplify this and this is where the torture comes in. Because when I square this, or if I were to square this as written, this to get rid of the square root, this is a binomial. And when I multiply the binomial, I have to square that and square that and multiply those two things together and double it. And I still get a radical. And so why finding the equation for an ellipse by definition is torturous is because you're going to have to square twice in order to get rid of both of the radicals. Now to make my life a little bit easier, I am not actually going to square this as written because I don't want to multiply those two radicals together when I square things. What I really want to do is I want to move one of these radicals to be with the 20 because that binomial is much nicer to square than that binomial. So I moved this one over to there by subtracting 
And now this is the equation I'm going to square on both sides. And squaring on both sides here gives me x squared plus y plus 5 squared. And squaring here gives me 400 minus uh, 40 square roots of x squared plus y minus 5 squared plus x squared plus y minus 5 squared. Now, squaring once doesn't completely simplify anything. It just got rid of that radical, and I still have that one left over. Now, if you were insane and had a lot of free time, then you can totally go ahead and square this. So what you have to do at this point is to get this square root by itself before you square anything. And so that's going to take a little bit of work. Now, luckily for us, some stuff cancels off, like those x squareds are gone. And if I expand y plus 5 quantity squared, I get y squared plus 10y plus 25. And if I expand this one out, I get y squared minus 10y plus 25. And more stuff cancels out, like the y squareds and 25s. And so if I think about what I have left over, I have 10y on this side, 400 minus 40 square roots of stuff, and then minus 10y. Now if I want to, I can just go ahead and square this, but those numbers are too big. So I'm going to divide everything by 20, which means I get y minus 20 equals negative 2 square roots of x squared plus y minus 5 squared. Now I don't like squaring a fraction, which is why I'm leaving that negative 2 there. And now at this point, I can square everything. So now finally all my radicals are gone, and I want to simplify it down as much as I possibly can. So then I'm going to get y squared minus 40y plus 400 over there equals 4 times x squared plus y squared minus 10y plus 25. And then I go ahead and simplify some more, and I get 4x squared plus 4y squared minus 40y plus 100. Okay, so now I want to see if anything cancels, and the negative 40 y's are canceled. And I want to put all the x's on one side, all the y's on the same side with it, and put the number by itself. And so when I simplify it, I get 4x squared plus 3y squared equals 300. And this is one version of the equation. It's the simplified version, and all conics have a simplified version of their equation. And what tells me this is an ellipse is the fact that it's going to be an x squared plus a y squared, and the coefficients of x squared and y squared are different. If that were 4x squared plus 4y squared, it would be a circle, but since it's 4x squared plus 3y squared, that means it's slightly, it's slightly stretched in one direction, which gives me the ellipse format. And it has to be plus, because if it's minus, it's another type of conic. Now there is another version of the equation, and this other version of the equation is the one that's super useful. It's going to look a little weird. What you do to this equation is you divide it by 300 on both sides, and what you get is x squared over 75 plus y squared over 100 equals 1. And this is the other version of an equation for an ellipse, and this is the super useful one, because that 75 and that 100 actually have to do with the physical properties of the ellipse. Now let's graph that ellipse and figure out what those properties are. Now let's talk about graphing ellipses. There are really three things you need. First, you need to find any intercepts. And if your ellipse has a center on the origin, those intercepts will also answer part two which is to find the limits or the extent of the graph. Because if you think about an ellipse, you can draw a little rectangle, and an ellipse is going to live within that rectangle. And the lengths and widths of those rectangle are going to be the major and minor axes. So if your ellipse is centered at the origin, then your intercepts actually happen to give you the extent of your graph. If it's not centered at the origin, then you have two ways of finding the extent of the graph. You can transform the equation you're given into x equal and y equal and analyze the resulting radical equation for possible input values. It'll, it's kind of like limiting the domain and range of those x equals and y equals versions of the equations. Or, and this is easier, find the length of the major and minor axes because your ellipse has to live within that rectangle formed by those lengths. 
And then you just have to find a couple more points and use symmetry. And what I mean by use symmetry is if you're given an ellipse centered at the origin, you can reflect through axes to figure out different points. Because let's say you find this beige point. Well, if you reflect it through the x-axis, you're going to get another point. And if you have that beige point and you reflect it through the y-axis, you're going to get that red point. And if you have that beige point and you reflect it through the origin, you're going to get it that green point there. Now, if the center of your ellipse is not the origin, you can still use symmetry, but you're going to have to use the major and minor axes. So let's try to graph this one. This is the equation that we came up with by definition. So if I want to find the intercepts of this, I just have to set x or y equal to 0. So if I have x equal to 0, I get 3y squared equals 300, or y equals plus or minus 10. So those are my y-intercepts. And if I want to find my x-intercepts, I have 4x squared plus 3 times 0 equals 300, which means 4x squared is equal to 300, x squared is equal to 75, or x is equal to plus or minus 5 root 3. And if you have a calculator handy, 5 root 3 is approximately 8.5-ish. So now I have my intercepts. Now the second thing is to find the extent of the graph. And since my ellipse is centered at the origin, I know that my ellipse has to live in a rectangle that is going from 10 to negative 10 vertically, which means it has width in this case of 20, and it goes from negative 5 root 3 to 5 root 3. Now if this thing were not centered at the origin, I'd have to analyze 4x squared plus 3y squared equals 300 for x and y. And what I mean by that is I would have to solve for x equals and y equals. And so if I want to figure out the possibilities of the x's, I have to look at this equation and think about what y values I could have that are real. So I have to look underneath here and think about what makes this real. And it turns out that it's 10 and negative 10. Uh, the length of the ma major axis in this case. And if I do something similar and transform it to y equals, then I'm going to get negative 5 root 3 to 5 root 3 as being the extent of where that number under the radical is going to be real. So of course, you, that's what I meant by finding the extent of the graph by analyzing what x and y equals were in terms of the other variables. But seriously, if you just know the length of the major and minor axis, you know I'm doing any of this stuff here. And the third part of graphing was just to find a series of points. And so if I just said x equals 1 and solved for y, I would get another point to graph. If I said x equals 2 and solved for y, I'd get another point to graph. And actually, I don't get one point to graph. Remember, each of these will turn into four points. So just finding these two values, I'm going to get eight more points to graph. And I can sketch a pretty decent ellipse with that. And let's see what that graph is going to look like. So this is the graph of that ellipse. 5 root 3 is about 8.5. And then, of course, we have about 10. And I've included this equation here. Hmm, I wonder if 5 root 3 and 10 have anything to do with 175. Well, if you square 5 root 3, you get 75. And if you square 10, you get 100. So this number here is actually the square of half the major axis. And this number here, if I square root it and double it, that's the length of the minor axis. So summing up all that information, if I have an ellipse at center 0, 0, and my foci are located at negative C0 and C0, I'm going to call the distance from the center to the focus C. My sum of my focal radii is going to be 2A, so this is length A and that's length a, so I get 2a. And then the length of my minor axis is going to be 2b. And if I have an ellipse centered at the origin with foci that are horizontally aligned on the x-axis, then I know its equation is going to be x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. And the key little factoid you need to remember that's super important for making equation writing easier is this one right here that says b squared equals a squared minus c squared. So if I change my orientation of my foci to be vertically arranged along the y-axis, every other relationship is still the same. It's just what's swapped is the location of the a and the b.